condition. And Dr. Schoback will be giving us an overview of hypocalcemia. And then we have three cases to follow. So we look forward to an exciting day. And thank you for being here. Dolores. Okay, great. Can, can everybody hear me okay? I'm using a, a speaker phone. I can hear you well. Okay, all right. Let's just We're go good. ahead. So thank you. Um, and thanks, thanks for everyone for being there. Um, and so we're going to talk in the next just 15 minutes um, about hypocalcemia, how to approach it, what causes it, and what disorders one needs to think about. Next slide. Oh. Michael, so did you hear that? My, yes, I did. Got it. So my disclosures and, and putative, any putative conflicts of interest are listed here some consulting and some um, more distant research funding from NPS Shire. Next slide. So this is just a, re a quick refresher for everyone, um, just to, re to remind you that the systems in our body are set up very, very um, uh, intensely to regulate the serum calcium within a very narrow normal range. And so um, if you think first about the parathyroid chief cell, it secretes parathyroid hormone in response to a low calcium, that sort of yellow highlighted little bubble next to the calcium sensing receptor in the parathyroid uh, membrane. That um, parathyroid hormone mobilizes calcium out of the bone. It, pre, um, it stimulates the reabsorption of calcium in the kidney. It stimulates the excretion of phosphate in the kidney. And then one other very important function is to stimulate the conversion of 25 hydroxy vitamin D to 125. And as you know, that's the most important vitamin D metabolite. And that acts on the intestine to bring calcium and phosphorus back into the body. And then when down near the bottom in the right hand corner, when the calcium uh, concentration goes back up, the, uh, that feedback feeds back to the parathyroid calcium receptor and suppresses PTH. So those are the systems in our body that are critically important in the regulation of serum calcium. And so when we start talking about hypocalcemia, you really need to think about a very integrated set of systems that include all these different organ systems as well as the parathyroid uh, chief cell and the hormones PTH and 125D. Next slide. So in, in the adult world um, and in the pediatric world as well, but in the adult world we think about hypocalcemia as being caused by a problem in the parathyroid gland, and that accounts for sort of post-surgical hypopara being the big um, item there, about 75% of um, hypoparathyroidism is due to post-surgical situation. And then all these other things that I've listed on this slide, autoimmune uh, hypopara, functional hypopara, um, uh, replacement of the gland by different um, heavy metals, tumors, et cetera. And then the many genetic syndromes um, are all, you know, reasons to have hypoparathyroidism and one needs to consider them when you're looking at a patient with hypocalcemia who looks like he or she has a parathyroid problem. Then vitamin D figures really importantly here, either through poor diet, poor sunlight exposure, problems in those um, important organs we talked about, absorption of uh, vitamin D, liver disease, pancreatic disease, kidney disease, bowel surgery, all of those things can lead to problems with vitamin D that ultimately, after a long time, can present with hypocalcemia. Next slide. Let me just Please. change to a presenter mode real quick. Okay. Um, is that, did, are people seeing the full screen or with the notes section? We're seeing the uh, we're seeing the presenter mode where you Present. where you show the next slide. Yeah. Let me go. I pause. I want to make it more clear for people. Um, it should be. It's just that. No, that's not right. Um, I apologize, everyone. That's okay. Well, should it just be? Here, let me just exit out of here. Sorry for the brief intermission, everyone. Uh, <laughs> okay. We're gonna just. There we go. No, that looks fine. We're just gonna okay. do this like that. Okay. This is okay. Better. So I think we're on the fifth. Oh, great, great. The mm -hmm. animate. There's not many animations, but mm -hmm. they're showing up. Great. Okay. Great. 
Okay. And so then uh, sort of second, second in line in, in terms of the causes for hypocalcemia are resistance to the, those important hormones, so pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, and there's a couple types of that, subtypes. Vitamin D-dependent rickets, there's two types of that, one and two. And then when you're working up a patient with hypocalcemia, you do need to think about the medication list. Are they receiving anything that can be actually uh, a cause for hypocalcemia? And I've listed them here. Um, and uh, uh, then there's really a large category of miscellaneous etiologies. Uh, hungry bone being one we see in endocrinology a fair amount. Sometimes we see it in tumor-induced osteomalacia, although not so commonly. Um, and then critically ill patients in the ICU, septic patients, uh, of course, uh, often uh, will have hypocalcemia, which often reverses as that improves liver transplants and rhabdomyolysis. So a long list, but the parathyroid uh, disorders and vitamin D are big ones uh, on this list. Next slide. So the signs and symptoms, I think, are pretty well known to pediatricians and internists, but they do involve the neuromuscular system with, you know, greater sensitivity uh, to any kind of um, uh, cramping or um, abnormal sensations like paresthesias, particularly around the, the lips and the fingers and the toes are what patients complain about when their calcium is low or is dropping. And you certainly would like to not see, but can sometimes occur sort of a uh, tightness in the throat or even a, a wheezing due to bronchospasm or laryngospasm. Those are certainly, you know, emergency type of symptoms in um, hypocalcemic patients. And then we pick it up by the Schwastek sign and the Trousseau sign. Some patients with hypocalcemia uh, can have altered mental status, altered thinking, can even progress to seizures and coma. So those are certainly hoped to be avoided. Um, and then just general muscle fatigue and weakness. Occasionally, we'll see a patient with congestive heart failure due to sort of undiagnosed and untreated hypocalcemia. And then on the EKG, chronic um, hypocalcemia particularly can prolong the QT uh, interval. Next slide. So we evaluate these patients the way you do really in, in medicine and pediatrics, careful history careful physical, looking for some of the findings uh, of those disorders that I've, I've mentioned to you on your differential diagnosis, careful assessment of laboratory testing. And I do use the ionized calcium um, in, in patients with hypocalcemia often to just kind of reinforce that, this, that the total calcium, the albumin corrected total calcium is in fact telling me something that needs to be worked up. So I, I, I often will use it. So it's a good use for it. Don't forget to measure the serum magnesium. Obviously, you're gonna look at the creatinine to make sure kidney function is intact. And the phosphate can play a pretty helpful role in the first pass through the laboratory test. And of course, PTH is a critical measurement to make because you're trying to decide, have I got a case of hypoparathyroidism in front of me or do I have a low calcium and the parathyroids are responding appropriately? And we'll look at some lab profiles in a moment. So PTH is a central measurement. And then because, you know, vitamin D is so important in, um, in thinking about hypocalcemia, the 25-hydroxy is the measurement you want to make because it tells you about the total body store of vitamin D. We often will measure 125D, and it can be helpful, very helpful in certain circumstances, but the 25 is the one you really want to make sure you have. And then urinary calcium and magnesium can be very helpful. Uh, depending on the circumstances of the patient. Next slide. Uh, that's okay. Sorry. Yep, sorry about that. No problem. So these are just nothing, we're not going to run through this entire list here, but these are just some laboratory profiles and these common causes for hypocalcemia that, you know, you, you can see and you will recognize. And so as I said, the PTH is a central measurement. And if you take a look at the PTH column there, you can see that PTH is going to be low in parathyroid problems, but it's going to be elevated or normal in just about everything else on the list. So critical measurement to make. And the phosphates are also a super important measurement because it's going to be elevated in hypopara. It's going to be elevated in pseudo-hypopara and in chronic kidney disease, of course. But if there's a vitamin D problem, it's going to be low. And um, if it's 
if the problem is a hypomagnesemia, it often is normal. So that's another key measurement to make. And these are just some profiles you might come back to um, in thinking about uh, your evaluation of a patient with hypocalcemia. Next slide. Next slide, Michael. Yeah. Sorry about yeah, that. There we it's, go. It's, yeah, no, really. no problem. Sticking probably. Yeah. So I just thought I would, you know, make a few remarks, and I know we only have a couple more minutes, um, four more minutes. Just talk a little tiny bit about some of the um, some of the disorders on that list of diseases that cause hypocalcemia. And one is a is a is sort of a mixed bag category out of a, of autoimmune hypoparathyroidism. That can occur as an isolated condition, or it can occur as part of the polyendocrine or polyglandular syndrome. Um, and the type one polyendocrine syndrome, or APS1 is the one that contains hypoparathyroidism as part of it. These are typically autosomal recessive um, cases where there's loss of function mutations in a gene called AIR, and I've listed what that abbreviation stands for. So it's very, very important in autoimmunity, this gene, and it's very important in regulating the ability of our body to uh, tolerance, basically tolerance to self antigens. Next slide. And so I, I often quote this series, but there have been many since this uh, very large original series of patients with APS1, which catalogs the clinical features of that disease. So nearly 100% of these patients have mucocutaneous candidiasis, often very early in life. Hypopara, you can see 80%, adrenal insufficiency, 70%, gonadal failure, particularly in, in females, 60%, much less in males. But you can make this diagnosis clinically if a patient has two of those three endocrinopathies uh, or, or candidiasis. But any of those top three, two out of the top three, are going to make the diagnosis clinically. And then the testing can involve genetic testing with air gene sequencing, or it can uh, look for, or, the, or testing can look for the, anti, the autoantibodies that these patients make. And some of the most important ones are autoantibodies to the type 1 interferons and to uh, very important cytokines in our body. And these are probably the most specific for the APS1. And they neutralize, they basically neutralize the activity of these cytokines. So you can, you can anticipate why these patients have so many autoimmune and um, immune deficiency features to them. And so those antibodies are a great marker. They're not easy to get, but they're a great marker for this syndrome. Next slide. So this is just a, um, a depiction of when these um, manifestations of APS1 appear. Mucocutaneous candidiasis, you can see with the red solid line, occurs very early in life, like age one, age two, et cetera. A hypopara, often in childhood, 80% of these patients by the time we will see them as internists, will already have their hypopara. And Addison's a little bit lower rate, but very similar time course later in childhood. Next slide. Okay, and I'll just, uh, just tell you a little bit about pseudo-hypoparathyroidism because that's often on the differential when you see a patient with hypocalcemia with an elevated PTH. And there you can see the profile and the blood test. And this is due to resistance to the actions of PTH. Typically, because of resistance at the level of the kidney. Usually, the bone isn't resistant, so it's just the kidney uh, that shows its resistance. And um, the most common form of this rare disease is a decrease in the production of GS alpha, the important G protein that couples the PTH receptor to downstream signaling, particularly in the proximal tubule of the kidney. And in, that, uh, in the kidney, the GS alpha gene is what we call paternally imprinted. So that means the paternal allele is silenced. So if you have your mutation on your, the, the uh, allele uh, for GS alpha that you got from your father, that one is silenced and your the transcription will be off your mother's gene, which hopefully is normal. And you will either have the phenotype if you got it from your mother or not have it if you got it from your father. Next slide. So that's type 1A, and these are autosomal dominant in general. And I've just 
um, explained, type 1A is due to the mutation in the coding region. And if you have the mineral disturbance, the up there on the top, the low calcium, the high phosphorus, the elevated PTH, that means you got that from your mother. And typically, these individuals have um, a varying spectrum of Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy, the shortening of the metacarpals, the round facies, the obesity, the short stature. If you got that gene from your father, um, so it's silenced in the renal tubule, you may have, you often will have the Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy, but your minerals and your PTH should be pretty normal. And we call that pseudo-hypopara. And then pseudo-hypopara type 1B is due to mutations elsewhere in regulatory regions of GS alpha that alter the expression of the protein, but it doesn't have the other features uh, typically of um, Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy. Next, next slide. And then type two is a mutation somewhere else in this signaling pathway. Next slide. Uh, I am already over time, so I will leave magnesium because it comes up in the first case um, to be discussed with that first case. Um, and I'll leave the rest of these slides for reference for you. And maybe Michael, you can just just go just go through them so that people can mm -hmm. see that there are some good references uh, for the for magnesium wasting disorders. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Just some places in the kidney where this can occur. Next slide. A diagnostic algorithm uh, for working up patients with hypomagnesemia. Next slide. The lab evaluation. Next slide. Vitamin D-related disorders that we've already actually talked about them. Next slide. And then the th three slides on the treatment of acute hypocalcemia. Uh, next slide. That's the second. IV calcium, the next slide. And then the oral regimens and how to monitor patients. So I think we'll stop now and we'll start with the first case unless there are questions based on the presentation.